Hey everybody, it's Chris from Chris Beat Cancer, and today I'm talking with Dr. Scott Stoll. Dr. Stoll is the co-founder of the Plantrition Project, the International Plant-Based Nutrition Healthcare Conference, the International Journal of Disease Reversal and Prevention, and the Regenerative Health Institute, which is a collaborative project with the Rodale Institute that integrates a regenerative vision for human health, agriculture, and the environment. Dr. Stoll is a member of the Google Food Lab. He serves on the advisory board at Whole Foods for their healthcare clinics. And he served as member of the Whole Foods Scientific and Medical Advisory Board. Every year, Dr. Stoll hosts the Total Health Immersion event in Naples, Florida, in which he helps attendees restore and optimize their health, overcome addictions, and develop a sustainable, regenerative lifestyle. In addition to authoring several books, including Your Next Bite and numerous scientific articles, Dr. Stoll has appeared on national shows like Dr. Oz. He even hosted a 2018 PBS special, Food as Medicine, and he's been featured in numerous docu uh, documentaries, including Eating You Alive, Wait Till It's Free, and The Game Changers. So Dr. Stoll is, uh, is a bit of a legend. And uh, I'm a big fan personally. I'm so excited to, to interview Dr. Stoll. Thank you for taking the time. Oh, Chris, it is my sincere honor to be able to spend the next hour with you and with your, um, with your tribe that's been following you. You've done so much uh, inspirational work, and I just want to take a minute to appreciate you and honor you for taking a, a leadership role in this space and being such an encouragement and inspiration. So uh, it's, it's really an honor to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. That, hey, man. That means so much to me. It really does. So I'd love to start. I've interviewed a lot of doctors who are uh, plant-based. And I love to hear the origin story. Uh, you, know, the, when, you know, when was the tipping point for you? Because I imagine you probably didn't grow up eating a plant-based diet or a mm -hmm. vegan diet, right? And at some point That's in right. your life, you know, you, you learn some things and, and you change. So what, how did that happen for you? No, you're absolutely right. You know, I grew up in a family that was interested in health and uh, my dad was always looking for ways to tweak our diet. You know, we'd get rid of chocolate and we'd add carob in and a carob chocolate cake is just not the same as a chocolate cake. He had bran on the breakfast table and mixed bran in his orange juice. So there was an interest in health in our household, but I pretty much ate a standard American diet. Yep. And, uh, you know, lots of milk, lots of meat. And uh, I was an athlete and ran track in college, um, ended up having an opportunity to go to the Olympics, the 1994 bobsled team. And I only say that because, uh, you know, athletes sometimes, you know, think that they have a corner on the market on health and really understand what you need to be healthy. I was nutritional science and undergraduate in biochem and pre-med. So again, I thought I learned a lot about nutrition. And then through medical school, you know, we received you know, four to six hours of nutritional education. And it's really not the nutrition that you need to understand to prevent or suspend or reverse disease. So um, I finished my residency. I started practicing as a um, interventional physiatrist in sports medicine, taking care of neck and back pain and, and uh, team physician at Lehigh. And, uh, you know, early in my career, in the first year, my patients would come in and they would say, Dr. Stoll, can't you help me? I'm falling apart. And then I would go to a family get together and I would hear Uncle Joe say, you know what, I'm falling apart. And it just became this repetitive saying. And sometimes those things get sticky and they stay in your brain. And I became aware of how many times I heard people saying and they were falling apart. So I, I was curious and I, from my, you know, my uh, medical understanding and, and education, I thought this was just the natural consequence of getting a, uh, older and aging, that we develop diseases, that it's kind of the, um, you know, consequences of our genes and we can't do anything about it. So we see the doctor, we get medications and we get treated to try and maximize the quality of life. Well, there was a day in my practice, there was a woman sitting on the exam table, and uh, she said to me, Dr. Stoll, can't you ha help me? I'm falling apart with a smile on her face. And I just stopped her and I said to her, what does falling apart mean to you? It was a simple question. And you know, like a lot of doctors, we often are anticipating answers because we're moving through our day so quickly. So I was looking at her past medical history list, trying to figure out which of those problems was most problematic. Um, but she stopped me cold in my tracks when she said, my marriage is falling apart because my husband is so tired taking care of me all these years. We're facing financial bankruptcy because of the cost of our health care. I haven't been able to travel to see my grandchildren in three years. 
I can't go to church because I can't consistently sit for an hour. Um, I, my friends have stopped coming around and I'm depressed. And then with tears running down her cheeks, she looked at me and said, can you help me? And in that moment, I felt completely helpless. I thought back about you know all of the big um, uh, books that I've read on pharmacology and pathophysiology of disease. And I realized in that moment that all of her past medical history problems were undermining the most valuable things in her life. And I didn't have any way or any knowledge of how to help her put her life back together again, nor did I, did I even understand how these past medical history problems could be resolved. So when I walked out of that room, I said to myself, Scott, what are you going to do to actually help the next person that tells you that they're falling apart? And that sent me on kind of a personal research journey. You know, I started, uh, I started reading diet books because I thought certainly one of these really intelligent doctors that's written a diet book solution. And I read from Atkins to Zone and everything in between. And uh, when I finished, I was more confused than when I started. <laughs> Is a high carb, low carb, low fat, high fat. And then I read the studies on, you know, meta-analysis of diets. And they, they found that, you know, looking at 935 um, diets, that only 15% of people will keep 20 pounds off for five years. So it's a failed strategy. And none of them really got to the heart of the matter, which is reversing disease. So I got certified in age management medicine, realized that wasn't the solution. And I went back to kind of my nutritional roots and I started looking at the literature. And I saw the research that shows that more fruits and vegetables healthier body. I said, can it really be this simple that we just change what we eat? And it was uh, shortly thereafter that uh, Dr. Campbell came out with his book and I read the, the um, China study as many of us have. Uh, and I learned that Dr. Furman was not far from me. So I went and spent some time in his office and it confirmed everything that I had been reading that the more plants that we eat, the healthier we become. And in fact, so healthy that we can begin reversing disease. So we changed at home first. I have six children. We started eating healthy at home and our family became healthier. My children have never been on antibiotics. Um, and then I started transforming my practice and using my prescription pad to write smoothie recipes and breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I saw remarkable transformations, not only in my patients, but also in my staff because, you know, people started getting better and were grateful. And so my staff became happier and they, are, they started to make changes too. So it transformed every aspect of our lives. That uh, sounds like it'd be a great Instagram post, you know, the, the prescription pad with the smoothie recipe written on it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, you know, it's really interesting to me that your story is a little different than a lot of other, um, I'd say, plant-based MDs that I've talked to in the sense that you actually got a nutritional science degree. And yet, like, w what, what did you come away with? Like, you know, here's your degree. Right. And like, what was in your head at that moment? What did you believe? Like, what did you learn? Yeah, you know, I learned, uh, you know, about the scientific composition of food. Um, I learned about, um, you know, prescribing diets and some of the basic things like glycemic, glycemic index and lower fat foods. Um, I learned about diseases like um, celiac disease where they have a gluten allergy. Uh, I learned about, you know, hospital administration and food ordering and, but I did not learn this core principle of food as medicine. I had no concept of the power of food when I left my undergraduate program. Wow. Yeah. That's, yeah, that really is interesting to me. Um, I don't know how much of, of you, of my story, you know, but the, um, the first meal that I was served in the hospital after having a third of my large intestine removed surgically was a sloppy joe amazing yeah so Such a disconnect. yeah i mean is there a worse food i'm not sure <laughs> i'm not sure but yeah even at that time this was december 2003 i i knew the difference between health food and junk food and like even at that time i was like gross like why are you serving this to sick people to cancer patients right so there's a real disconnect in healthcare where you know healthcare does not have any concept of, of food equaling health uh, or disease reversal you know it's strictly like calories carbohydrates protein and fat and that's essentially the the full understanding and then they're trying to meet um you know taste preferences and so it's it's really tragic, but 
that's why we're doing what we do, right? Absolutely. I was in the hospital with uh, someone recently, and th it's funny. Things have changed. Uh, some hospitals are, are very health conscious now, and that's wonderful. Uh, and I'm sure you know you're on the front lines of this, so I think you, you're probably seeing a lot of that. And I've lo I'd love to get to that in the conversation and talk about what you're seeing happening, you know, in healthcare and in terms of nutrition and things. But it's just this is just a funny anecdote. But uh, now at this particular hospital, they actually bring a menu to the patient, and they have like they they can like order you know various food items off a menu. Doesn't mean any of them are healthy. But uh, I thought it was kind of there were there were a few options on there that looked a little healthier than the others. But uh, it was kind of funny that now they have this like instead of just like, you know, here's your tray, here's your meal, like which I, I equate to like prison, you know, or, or being in the military. Right. Like, here's your sloppy Joe. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, now you can order, you know, a filet or something. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Hospital kitchen filet. That sounds delish <laughs> so okay so you learned a lot right you had some like epiphanies and that that changed your family's diet first your own diet and then you started incorporating that into your practice and what, what happened from there so um you know I, you start to when you have an epiphany like this and then you see the visible evidence of it day after day as patients you know, begin reversing their diseases, discontinuing medications and saying since I was 18, you really start to become a believer. And so, uh, you know, one of the things that I think happens for all of us is we start sharing the good news with lots of people around us. And I shared it with my colleagues, my orthopedic colleagues, and uh, they were not very impressed. And so I got a lot of pushback early on. And, uh, you know, one of my colleagues who I respect and we have a good friendship, he would call me the voodoo doctor, you know, and he would send me all the people that he didn't know what to do with, but I would get them better and send them back and then tell them about plant-based diets and nutrition. And so, you know, over time they converted. But so after this, I, I had an opportunity to serve on the medical and scientific advisory board at Whole Foods and uh, was asked um, to start uh, heading up a uh, immersion program. Uh, John McDougall, Joel Furman, uh, uh, Rip myself are still doing these immersion programs where it identifies about 100 of the most unhealthy team members and they send them to spend a week with us. And so we feed them 100% whole food plant-based diet for a week and we teach them how to take care of their bodies and all about nutrition. We do some activity and we have a lot of fun um, on the beach. And uh, that week continue, continues to reinforce to me the power of food to change somebody's life in just a week. You know, we have people that come through with acute rheumatoid arthritis and, you know, synovitis and swollen joints. And in just a week, they're able to close their hands because the pain is gone. Uh, we taper people off medications in a week. We actually have them see a physician three times during the week while I'm teaching to taper medications because their bodies get well so quickly. And so it's just amazing to me that you can abuse your body for, you know, 10, 20 or 30 years and accumulate all of this kind of disease debt and uh, inflammation, but just one week of doing the right, right thing, and the body kind of jump starts back to healing, and things get better. And uh, inevitably, by the end of the week, people are saying, I haven't felt this good in 20 years. You know, I haven't had this much mental clarity in 20 years because the neuroinflammation is going away. So that reinforced me the power of, of food and continues to do so. Um, and it was shortly thereafter that um, I started to think about all of my colleagues and how long it took me to you know, acquire this information and this knowledge. And I said to a friend of mine, Tom Dunn, I'm like, Tom, you know, we need to start a conference to educate healthcare providers and help them learn the information in a shorter period of time. So in 2013, we started the International Plant-Based Healthcare Conference, and we started that in Naples, Florida. And that's grown to be you know, a really wonderful conference. It's a three-day conference. Uh, we have about 1,000 healthcare providers from 20 countries that, that show up and um, and one of our visions was, you know, to create an environment where people have an opportunity to be in community for three days, not just to come and get, you know, continuing medical education and lectures, but to sit at tables and share meals for three days. So we provide breakfast, lunch and dinner during that entire conference uh, to facilitate conversations, because that's where change really is seated in those uh, those relationships that, that develop around the table. So. We've had amazing um, things that have come out of that conference. 
And yeah, I've, heard, um, I've heard so many, so many good things about the Plantrition Conference. And before we go, continue, I want to clarify a couple things about what you just talked about, because it broke up a little bit as you were talking. Okay. Most of it came through. But one was the, the third doctor you said that was involved with your one week retreat. Who was that? Yeah, so um, it's uh, the Whole Foods has Dr. Um, uh, uh, Dr. McDougall, Dr. Furman, uh, Rip Asselston, and myself. Got it. Uh, doing the that's the one that. Okay, and that's that's not open to the public. That's just for Whole Foods employees. They, they are open to the public, and so the public can join us at those as well. And we have, you know, families and individuals that will come and spend that week with us as well. We have an amazing time. All the immersions are really incredible. Okay. You know, we do a dinner this one night. We do a, a beach party, and so we try to make it a lot of fun. I will post links to that uh, below this interview for anybody that wants to find out more. And um, the Plantrition Project, is that open to the public or just for medical professionals? No, it's open to the public. Um, I always give the, uh, the warning that, you know, it is a medical conference, so if you do come, you're welcome. But sometimes the, the la medical language can be a little challenging in a lecture. So, but we have, we have members of the general public that come. I mean, the lectures are really amazing. They are top notch and they're usually cutting edge science. So it's a great place to come and learn. And it's a really inspirational environment to see, you know, a thousand healthcare providers from all these countries gathering together with the same mind and the same attitude. And I always say it's probably one of the few medical conferences where you're more likely to get a hug than a handshake. So nice. So I would love for you to talk about uh, some of the diseases that you've seen turn around uh, in your practice and even in, in just the one week retreats, you know, just for anybody watching that's wondering, like, will this help me? You know, like, what, what have you seen people turn around with just simple changes to their diet back to fruits and vegetables? Yeah, it's, it's always amazing to me, you know, simple things from, uh, you know, acne. Uh, in teenagers uh, resolves very quickly, even in just a couple of weeks, especially with the discontinuation of dairy. Uh, psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis go away. As we mentioned, rheumatoid arthritis can be, um, you know, significantly improved or reversed with um, with a whole food plant based diet and lifestyle intervention. Um, I've worked with many people who have had multiple sclerosis and either really improved their symptoms or they've gone into remission on a whole food plant based diet, including resolution of the Infl inflammatory lesions in their brain and in their spinal cord. Um, uh, vision has improved in some patients. Bone density has improved. Hearing has improved. Um, uh, the, the mouth improves with uh, in, you know fewer cavities, especially as the microbiome in the mouth uh, gets better. I've had many people with thyroid conditions, uh, hypothyroidism and um, Hashimoto's um, hyperthyroidism have resolution and even discontinuation of medications. Doesn't always happen with hypothyroidism, but the thyroid can improve just depending on the severity. Um, my, uh, fibromyalgia significantly improved. Uh, severe heart disease you can be, if it's, non, if it's not surgically uh, necessary, can be resolved. And I've had a number of people, I have one patient that couldn't walk to the mailbox without popping nitroglycerin for chest pain. And six months later, he's walking three miles chest pain free. Um, obviously, type 2 diabetes, type 1 diabetes can improve. Um, you can significantly lower the insulin requirement for people living with type 1 diabetes. Um, osteoarthritis pain can get a lot better. All the irritable bowel conditions, Crohn's disease, Crohn's disease um, ulcerative colitis. Um, you know, it's so many. We could keep going. But it's a long it's a, list. <laughs> long list of things that get better. And sometimes I'm actually surprised, you know, things that do get better when you change your diet. Yeah. And I know you, you may not see many cancer patients and that's more my side of things, but I, you know, I've seen so many cancer patients turn things around. It's just incredible. So, um, yeah, it's powerful. And I love that you said in just a week, I mean, it really is miraculous how quickly, uh, the body can start to heal and or heal in such a short amount of time when you give it the proper nutrients and care. It's just like, you know, what a wonderful testament to our creator that our bodies yes. are so quickly regenerative and, and adaptive and desire to heal, you know, program to heal. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, and I just, I love what you're doing so much in, for so many reasons, but you know, what I see, and I imagine this was probably part of your conviction, um, 
before before you had such a big mindset shift, which was that so many patients, no matter what type of disease they have, are victimized. They're made out to be a victim of disease, and they're basically told by their doctor, uh, there's nothing that you did to contribute. You know, either they're either told that directly or they're told it indirectly, right? It's, n- it's nothing you did. Uh, it's just bad luck or it's bad genes. And, you know, we have some medications that maybe, you know, might help you with some of the symptoms. And out the door they go, you know, and it's it's just tragic. I mean, it's the same in cancer or diabetes or heart disease. I mean, it's pretty much the same across the board for chronic disease. And, um, and that's, I guess, part of my larger message is, is this, and really I'd say it's at the core. It's sort of like one of the building blocks of my message is that you're not a victim of disease, right? Like most diseases are caused by our choices. And it's not like, I'm not trying to blame people, make them feel bad about themselves, but I'm trying to empower them and say, hey, you know what? Guess what could happen if you change what you're eating? This could go away. <laughs> That's right. You're absolutely right. You know, and um, health is the, the body's natural state. The body wants to be healthy. And when we give it an opportunity, it naturally trends back in that direction of trying to regain health because of our choices. You know, I love the state uh, quote from Maya Angelou who said, you know, I did then what I knew how to do, but now that I know better, I do better. And for so many people, they just don't know. And so, you know, it's um, as we're telling people, you know, you and myself and other healthcare providers, you know, it's not to bring guilt or condemnation. It's just to bring awareness so that you can know better and then do better. And that's the really hope filled message of this plant based nutrition and lifestyle medicine is that, you know, the choices that we made in the past, we don't take on guilt or condemnation around those choices because in most cases we didn't know. But now that we know better, there's so much hope that by making a different choice today, we can begin to shift our physiology, we can begin to change our epigenome, we can change our function of our body, and we can rewrite our future, you know, one bite at a time. And that is what is so hopeful. And, you know, it breaks my heart because I see healthcare, and it is a hopeless organization, you know. Somehow we get trained in, in our um, early years of residency to speak these negative things over patients. You know, things like, I've never seen something so bad. This will never get better. And we send them out of the office with absolutely no hope and, um, and, and no vision for the future and this fear that might something really bad is going to happen to them. And, you know, you and I both know the power of words, the, you know, the power of life and death is in the tongue. And we speak those things out and it has a profound impact on people. But we also know that when we give people hope, it changes even the way their brain functions. And the functional MRI studies show us that when people have hope, it begins to activate all of the regions of the brain that are important for planning the future and deciding on the steps to get there. So the message that you're bringing, Chris, to give people hope um, does so much for them and, and gives them an opportunity to see the pathway forward and to begin making those changes. Wow, that's, man, I, I <laughs> you're right on the money. <laughs> that's like one of the other, I, I feel like foundational building blocks of, of wellness and healing is, is the belief, right? Just starting with that core understanding that you're not a victim, but then also the belief that healing is possible, right? That the belief that your body can heal and that your choices matter, right? And that the choices you make today affect tomorrow. Like you have the power to shape your future. And like, I've kind of gone down the rabbit hole on the placebo effect and the biology of belief and how powerful it is when you, when you just believe that something will help you you know it's crazy how the mind body connection works and um fortunately you know with uh fruits and vegetables you don't have to believe it or not they actually do help you (laughs) and no matter how skeptical you are they are going to give you benefit (laughs) that's exactly right we see that with even uh, patients that are getting tube feeds uh with you know fruits and vegetables their bodies like spring to health with just you know, a plant-based tube feed. So the body, it, it naturally fuels the body in the right direction. Smoothie in the tube. 
Smoothie in the tube, that's right. Is there, so I'd love to ask you about that. Are there commercially available products that, I mean, there's one that I know of, which is called Liquid Hope, which is, you know of that one? I sure do. And I know that there are a couple of others that are being uh, created or just manufactured now to start meeting that demand for, um, you know, giving people that uh, are not able to take anything by mouth the opportunity to get good nutrition through the tube. Yeah. And uh, I'm really excited about that. We're actually planning to do a study in Midland, Texas, uh, with people that are on respirators and um, giving them uh, liquid hope or plant-based tube feeds and then measuring their inflammatory biomarkers and the length of time on the ventilator. And we are hypothesizing that, you know, all of that's going to improve pretty dramatically. That sounds like an awesome study. I, I'm, ex- I'm excited to hear that. I'm looking forward to, to seeing the results. I, I feel optimistic they're going to be positive. <laughs> yeah, I do too. <laughs> I do too. So you, uh, now what, in your timeline, when, uh, when did you kind of start to make this transition to plant-based? What, around what year? So this was probably, uh, you know, starting 2000, late 2002, 2003. Got it. And so it was not very popular back then. No, and, and that uh, was when I, look, <laughs> I was diagnosed with cancer in December 2003. And, um, you know, there was very little information online, not, really nothing online that was helpful. I went from like just a handful of books that were pretty fringe you know, like yes. fringe, uh, you know, <laughs> alternative therapy, cancer therapy, or alternative health and wellness, or, you know, like, I mean, stuff on the bookshelf at Wild Oats or Whole Foods, right? Like, right. you know, <laughs> books that weren't in major bookstores, uh, and books that my mom had collected and saved from like, you know, uh, Paul Bragg books, and uh, right. Pavo Arola books, like, you know, raw food books from the 70s, my mom had saved up. It's kind of a, cr- a crazy... Wow. miraculous part of my story that my mom had collected all these weirdo fringe health and wellness books over the years. <laughs> uh, and then like when I got cancer, she had this library, but, um, but yeah. Okay. So, was, you know, we were in the same boat kind of trying to find information and I didn't have, like, I didn't even, I didn't read a single study back then. I didn't have access to study, didn't know how to get access to studies. You know, it was just book to book to book. And, and a lot of the books written back then didn't even have good citations. You know, if That's any, right. I mean, a lot of them, literally, there's one single citation in the whole book. It was just somebody <laughs> making a claim that like, you know, fruits and vegetables are powerful and can help you heal, you know, this kind of stuff. And uh, it was all anecdotal. Yeah, it's really, it's amazing when you look back. I have a lot of those old books as well. I, I've always enjoyed kind of going back and and reading what some of them wrote. Um you know, one of the most influential people um, at that time in the 70s was Nathan Pritikin. Um, and he had done a lot of work and had a lot of excellent citations and influenced many of the leaders today, uh, including Hans Deal and um, and Dean Ornish and John McDougall. And so and his, his place and Michael Greger, that's right, with his grandmother, I mean, a really influential person who did a good job of documenting the research. Yeah, and I I discovered Pritikin way later. I wish I had found uh, him sooner because it would have given me more ammunition and encouragement, yes. you know, and all that stuff. But he had kind of you know had a heyday and then kind of faded, kind of faded into obscurity yeah. by that point. And now there's been a resurgence and uh, sort of you know accolades and uh, uh, I don't know, just uh, admiration for all the incredible work that Pritikin did. That's right. Yeah, you're exactly right. Yeah. So, so what's next for you? What's, you know, what, what are you most excited about? Yeah, you know, um, a few things. Uh, yeah, the, I guess, you know, a, a few things that I'm excited about. One is that we started this um, really exciting project with the Rodale Institute. And the Rodale Institute is the leader in organic agriculture around the world. They were the first organic farm in America and probably in the world, certified organic. And they worked very closely with the USDA to help organize the uh, organic label. Um, and so they've been influential in the organic industry. Most people and don't know like how, what, how crazy influential Rodale has been. I mean, they published Prevention Magazine. Like, That's right. Going, when did they start? In the 20s? They started in the 1940s. J.I. Rodale started his farm in the, in the 40s and um, started the Institute in like 1947, 48, somewhere in that neighborhood. Yeah. 
And uh, so they've been around a long time. They've done a lot of fabulous work. Um, and, you know, they've influenced regenerative agriculture around the world, which is the concept of, you know, not just taking from the land, but regenerating the land that is feeding us. And so we started a project on their on their farm. Uh, I've always I had a vision for a long time of trying to help people understand the connections between healthy soil and how we make the soil healthy and protect the soil and how that creates healthier plants that when we consume them, we get healthy. And when that system's running correctly, our environment is healthy. We begin to regenerate our environment. So one day I was taking care of the executive director in my office um, for a rotator cuff injury. I was doing some PRP on his shoulder, injecting that into his rotator cuff. And I was telling him my, my vision. And he said, that sounds like a great idea. We should do that on the farm at the Rodale Institute. So I presented the idea to the board of directors. And they've set aside some land above their apple orchard now to build um, a brick and mortar regenerative health institute that will serve as a place where people can come and learn and be inspired uh, about this beautiful food web, this ecosystem that the soil creates, the plants that heal the people, that heals the environment. Um, and so we're working on that project. And I, I really love the, the concept of regenerative agriculture and understanding where I'm from. And that when we make choices about what to buy, we're, we're actually making a, an investment in the farm families and the health of the children in the, the management of the soil and the stewardship of the soil for future generations and resources like water and land um, and the, our lives and our family as well as the environment. And, you know, there's so much information in the environment now that shows that as we transition to a whole food plant-based diet grown regeneratively that we can sequester all the carbon and the environment begins to regenerate itself when we're making the right choices that, what to put on our plate. So I'm really excited about that project. That sounds and, amazing. Uh, that sounds really, really incredible. Um, you know, you, you mentioned something I'd love for you to touch on too, although I know it's it's sort of obvious, but I'd love to hear it just from your mouth. What's wrong with eating animals? Like, what's the problem, right? What's the problem? Yeah. First, I know there's two angles here, but like first, like the, the physiological problem yeah. and then the environmental problem. But I'd love to hear you weigh, on, weigh in on that. Uh, and just hear your perspective. Yeah, it's a really good question. I really, I, you know, I've tried to spend a lot of time answering this question, um, you know, scientifically for people so they can just grasp the, the reason they make those choices. Um, you know, I think first when we look at like epidemiologic studies, and then if we look at history, human history, we can see that kind of both have come to the place where, you know, um, animal consumption above maybe 10% of your calories uh, begins to create some changes in your physiology that make you more susceptible to disease. Um, you know, we know from the Blue Zone studies uh, and the China study and some other studies that, you know, most uh, healthy populations um, eat animals, you know, less than 5% of their total calories, maybe up to 10%. But it's never been a large percent of their calories. Many of the healthiest people groups like the ancient Israelites predominantly vegetarian with small amounts of animal products. But it's only been in modern history that, you know, the animal has become the primary focus of our plate. And now it's breakfast, lunch, and dinner, not just, you know, a celebratory meal or occasional meal, but it's, you know, we've, we've transitioned to eating animals very frequently. And that's a longer story. But to answer your question, you know, it's, um, there are several things um, in the animals that, that can complicate our health. Um, one, the way we produce animals today uh, we use a lot of antibiotics um, in animal production because the animals are under great stress and they want to make sure the animals stay alive to get to the, to the processing plant. So the antibiotic levels are, are very high. In fact, the, the majority of the antibiotics produced are used in animal and food production. And um, so as we consume those, they begin to injure our microbiome. And our microbiome is responsible for 75% of the health of our immune system. So that over time can have significant consequences. Um, we also know in animals that the heme iron, the iron from blood, um, is an inflammatory agent. It's a um, pro-oxidant, and it's also been related to uh, development of insulin resistance. We also know that animals have um, uh, a, a molecule called NU5GC. We don't have that in our bodies, but animals do. And in uh, humans, it's very inflammatory and causes um, inflammation. And inflammation in the arteries can precipitate uh, the formation of atherosclerosis. 
Um, in inflammation is also kind of a precursor for cancer. Um, we know that animals also contain endotoxins, which are the outer covering of bacteria, and they're, they're heat resistant. So even cooking the animal, these endotoxins can enter our system. And there's some really interesting studies that show that within two hours of consuming endotoxins, there's a spike of inflammation. There's also some interesting studies that correlate that spike of inflammation with a spike in depression and social disconnection. Um, we know that animals, especially as we cook them over a high flame, they, they create heterocyclic amines, which are the blackened or charred meat, uh, which has been shown to be carcinogenic. Saturated fat is also another challenge. There's a lot of debate around that, but a lot of the studies do show that it can be inflammatory and injurious to the, the uh, thin lining of our arteries called endothelium. Um, and so there's a host of reasons why you know, eating too many animals becomes so problematic. But also with fish today, they're not only a primary source of antibiotics and antibiotic uh, resistant bacteria, but there's a lot of um, heavy metals and toxins in the fish today because of uh, our use of um, these toxic chemicals. And so the larger the fish, the more toxic they become. And I've even had patients that have had uh, toxic levels of uh, mercury from eating too much tuna fish. So that's kind of a short answer on a longer topic, but for a number of reasons, you know, the overconsumption of animals causes a, a physiologic um, injury to our bodies. Th that's all, man? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a lot, right? There's a lot of that's ways, right. a lot of ways. Um, that I think a lot of folks don't, don't realize, you know, that um, eating excessive amounts of animal food injure your body. Uh, what do you say to the folks that maybe say like, oh, I just need, I just don't feel good if I don't eat protein. I just need to eat, I just need to eat animal protein or I don't feel good. What's your response to them? Yeah, we've heard that a time or two, haven't we, Chris, in our, our careers. Um, you know, I always like to say to them, uh, you know, did you know that kale has protein and broccoli has protein and a plant-based diet will give you more than sufficient protein? Um, and I'll always, I try to sometimes ask people a question to make them stop and think. And I'll, I'll ask them, I'll say, well, you know, um, why do you think that, um, you know, meat is the only source of protein? And, you know, they, they won't have a, a response to that. And then I'll, I'll show them some evidence that, you know, um, like, for instance, there was a wonderful study comparing 500 calories of peas and tomatoes cucumbers and lettuce to 500 calories of milk and um, meat. And they found that, uh, you know, in those 500 calories, the plants contain 33 grams of protein and the animals 34 grams of protein. So it's equal number of protein, amount of protein. However, the, the way the protein's packaged is even more important. And the plants come packaged with all of the micronutrients, 500 milligrams of calcium, uh, no saturated fat, no cholesterol, and the animals come with uh, packaged with cholesterol, saturated fat, um, very small amounts of micronutrients, and only 200 milligrams of calcium. And so I always ask people, you know, how do you want your protein packaged? Do you want it packaged with antioxidants, phytochemicals, lots of minerals and vitamins, and everything your body needs, or do you want it packaged with saturated fat, cholesterol, and very few micronutrients? because you're gonna get the same amount of protein. So the decision is really, what do you want packaged around your protein? Um, Not to mention so the I, other I things. I just try to paint that big picture. Right, uh, right, plus the other things you mentioned, like the heme iron in red yes. meat, and the, what's the molecule that's only in animal food? New 5GC. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, so that's, that's great. It's such a great way to put it, I love that. Um, and then the, the classic, you know, where does a gorilla get their protein? <laughs> you know, that's right. That's exactly right. Where's the cow that you eat get its protein? It gets the wheels turning. It's like, huh? Um, never thought of that before. Hmm. Uh, so that's great. I, I appreciate that a lot. And I, and I think, um, you know, it's I even saw something recently that uh, some some summary of, of study or studies where they found that people who eat plant based diets, assuming they're, you know, they're not in any kind of malnutritional state, right? Just eating lots of fruits and vegetables every day, beans, whole grains, nuts and seeds, uh, are consuming more protein than they actually need. That's exactly right. You know, it's, we don't have a protein deficiency problem in the United States. We have a protein excess problem. You know, most people are consuming 100, 120 grams of protein a day, and some 
bodybuilders are like two, 300 grams of protein a day. And that protein has a significant negative impact on your body long term. And so, you know, it's, it's really, you're exactly right. We're not eating too little protein. We're actually eating too much. And the average person needs how many grams per day? You know, typically, um, you know, uh, average woman needs about 40 to 50 grams. And the average man, like 60 to 70. You know, if it's a, an athlete with a high level of activity, you know, they may need, depending on their size, you know, 90, 100, 110 grams of protein a day and what they're trying to do. Uh, but we also know that by just simply increasing the caloric intake, you'll get sufficient amount of protein to meet those needs. You really don't need to do a bunch of um, protein powders and protein bars and drinks to, to make up for lost protein. Yeah, for me personally, um, I don't use protein powders. I have in the past. I've gone through all kinds of phases and, you know, experimental things. But, you know, I've found I, I'm very athletic. I do like, you know, CrossFit kind of stuff and rock climbing and, and I have a very high metabolism. So, you know, if I just if I'm traveling, I tend to lose weight because I'll, I'll miss a meal, you know, or two over a few days and I will actually lose some weight. So making sure I eat enough has always been a challenge for me. It's 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 a weird problem to have. Most people, you know, they're they have the opposite problem, right? But I uh, they're trying to lose weight. I'm trying to prevent weight loss. <laughs> but I found for me, it's it's not hard to get enough protein, you know, uh, nuts and seeds are wonderful sources, beans are fantastic. I, you know, hemp seed is incredible. And it's easy to add that stuff to salads, to smoothies, to oatmeal. We were talking earlier before I hit record, you know, every morning I have oats with hemp seed, flax seed, and chia seed in there. And uh, it's, you know, way more protein than I probably need just doing that for, for a, you know, for one meal. That's right. Yeah, That's it's exactly like 30, right. it's, it's between 30 and 40 grams just in that one meal for me. Right. And, it, you know, I think that's really uh, enlightening for people to see that, you know, not only are you getting your protein, but you got you know, tons of, of fiber and omega-3 fatty acids and phytochemicals. There's about 150 different phytochemicals in the average meal, all the antioxidants that came with that, that protein. So your body is just humming when you eat that kind of a meal and get that protein. Feels good. <laughs> so it sure does. A couple more. Uh, these are sort of fun questions that I love to ask. If you, uh, well, let me, I'll start with this one. Um, if you could only eat the same thing every day, right? Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It could be three different meals, but if someone said, okay, you got to eat the same breakfast every day, the same lunch every day, the same dinner every day, what would that look like? Yeah, that's a good question. That's a, I've never been asked that question before. You know, probably one of my favorite meals that um, if I had to eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner, um, I love to make like a, uh, make it at breakfast time sometimes. It's um, it's kale. I usually put in like sweet potato, purple potatoes, some onions and garlic, and I'll throw in a handful of beans. And if I had to do something three times a day, I would probably do that. It's delicious. It's power packed. It would have everything that I need in there and, and I, I could make it. It's kind of like a veggie bowl. Do you st st cook it all? I cook it all together and we serve it up for breakfast. Sometimes we make it for dinner. I cook it in but a pan? Probably, cook it in a pan. Yeah, so I saute. I just, uh, you know, hot pan, saute my onions, so no oil. Uh, put some garlic in and then I'll cook up the, uh, the sweet potatoes, potatoes, some beans, and then I steam the kale on the final. That sounds awesome. Yes, we. That sounds like something my wife whips up uh, uh, <laughs> regularly. Actually, <laughs> that's great. And so, so that would be your your staple meal if you only had to eat one meal for the rest of your life. What do you and what do you like to eat uh, on? A, what's what's a typical day look look like for you for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Yeah, you know, we have uh, through the years, especially with our family, it's pretty simple. We've learned that you know simplicity is reproducible and sustainable, and so. We keep it simple, you know, usually in the morning we have a green smoothie, uh, as much green kale as we can put in there, and then we'll, you know, make that a little different with different berries and sometimes mango and pineapple. Um, and then usually a big bowl of oatmeal, just like you, uh, with some berries, a few walnuts, some hemp seeds, chia seeds, and flax seeds. And so that's usually my breakfast. Um, I usually don't eat lunch. I'll just um, have like some veggies and maybe hummus or something over lunch. 
and then we try to eat a little bit early earlier dinner and then go longer overnight on a on a fast and so dinner time half of our dinner plate is salad some kind of big 25 percent is a, a steamed vegetable and then 25 percent is a cooked dish and in the cooked dish we do everything from you know, um, bean casseroles to curry dishes to whatever we're, we're hungry for. So soups and stews. But it's, you know, the only thing that we're really making decisions on is what the cooked dish is and what steamed vegetable. So it makes it really simple for us. That's uh, it's great. That's so it's very, very close to the way I eat as well on a daily basis, like oatmeal for breakfast. I usually have the big smoothie for lunch. So that's my lunch is the smoothie and with lots of berries and kale and stuff like that in there. Mm-hmm. It's almonds, walnuts, spinach, and all that. I'll link to it in the, the notes for anybody that wants to see it. And then dinner, we all we mix it up for dinner, but my wife will make a, a cook up a variety of veggies, you know, sweet potatoes, black beans, brown rice, quinoa, lentils, you know, some salad greens, you know, just all kinds of good stuff like that. Sometimes it'll be a soup or stew, and sometimes it'll be like a, a veggie bowl or like a burrito bowl or um, we... we uh, Sometimes we'll do tacos, but we'll do lentils instead of ground beef. Right. With, yeah, with that's the, excellent. Yeah, with the taco seasoning. Oh, it's delicious. It's so <laughs> good. Get the organic blue corn, you know, uh, taco shells. And yeah. So I'm just living. Yeah, it's good. I mean, yeah, it's like, and it's funny because I, um, you know, I'm, I'm often, you know, in circumstances, situations where, you know, I'm around people eating meat, right? Eating animals, eating meat, whatever. And I, I don't, you know, I think in somebody watching this that, that is having this thought like, oh, I could never give up meat or I don't think I could do that. It's amazing like when you get away from it, how how much your body changes. And literally, like, I just, it's not like I'm like, oh, that smells so good. I can't, but I can't eat it. You know, it's like I smell it. I'm like, yeah, I don't know. I just, there's no desire to eat it. It's not, I don't have to resist it's just like, yeah, no, it doesn't even smell good to me anymore. It doesn't, you know, it's like, that's how I am. And by the way, I'm not a vegan. So I like, I eat a plant-based diet. It's about 98, 99% plant-based. And that's, you know, based on the blue zones and things we talked about, like that's, I feel like very sustainable for me. And it's sustainable for a right. lot of people too, where they don't feel like it's this all or nothing proposition. That's, that's, that, and I that's think right. that's where I want, I, I want to meet people where they're at and help them understand like, if you cut back from three times a day to three times a week, you're making a 80% shift, right. like, which is massive. And you will get results from that. You know, like, let's just start Absolutely. there. So, That's right. yeah. And then you may find that, oh, I don't even really, once you go from 80, you know, three times a day to three times a week, then you may find, oh, three times a month. And then it may be just once a month or, you know, you may go months without eating anything from an animal. Right. So, That's right. That's the, you know, that's, that's my platform. That's what I encourage people to do. I feel like we're on the same page there too. It's like, listen, there's so much benefit. It, you don't have to join the 100% club, you know, to, to get benefits from nutrition. But um, your tastes change and your desires change. And you start to really crave fruits and vegetables. And you, you start to crave healthy food. And that's what you want to eat. It's, it's not like the whole diet mentality where... You know, you're like, oh, I'm not allowed to eat those foods. I can only eat this Jenny Craig meal, <laughs> right? That's right. That's exactly. Yeah, right. I mean that that's not sustainable, right? That's not sustainable for. That's why diets fail, right? Because humans, you know, they don't like to be controlled. And if you put them on a diet that's that they feel like is controlling them, that has rules that they have to follow, and if they don't follow the rules, then they have failed. Uh, it's uh, psychologically, it's just it's so unhealthy. And, uh, and so I know we have the same mission, which is to educate people and empower them and get them excited about nutrition and eating healthy food. So they want to do it. They just want to. Yeah, you're exactly right. And, you know, the research even shows when you tell someone that they can't have something, it actually turns on the craving for that whatever it was. And they actually have a stronger desire for it when they know they can't have it or they've been told they can't have it. And so you're right, this all or nothing uh, kind of dietary mantra is really devastating for people because it leads them you know, to, ha- to crave those things in a greater uh, degree than they did before. And then if they have it, 
they take on immediate guilt, shame, condemnation, you know, which sets them up for more challenges long term. So I always like to tell people though, you know, you're free to eat anything you want, as much as you want, anytime you want. But now that you know better, you can do better. You can make a better choice. And if you make a choice that's not as healthy, it's not the end of the world. You still have the next choice to eat something healthier uh, in your next bite or your next day. So it's freedom. You're free. And I, I really like that, uh, your approach of abundance and freedom, because that's what allows people to be successful. Yes, freedom. Absolutely. Freedom to choose health. Right. And hey, if you have something, if you eat something that's unhealthy, which I like to call recreational food. <laughs> if you eat something that's unhealthy, hey, you better enjoy it, you know? Like, at that's least right. enjoy it, right? Enjoy the, the piece of cake or something or whatever it is, right? Like, don't eat it from a place of guilt and shame and self-loathing. That's no good, you know? At least enjoy this right. occasional treat and, and put it in its proper place. But uh, but anyway, yeah, <laughs> Dr. Stoll, this has been so fun. I want to be respectful of your time. So we'll wrap it up. Uh, where can people find you? So they can find uh, some wonderful resources and find me, uh, obviously, the Plantrition Project. So that's plantritionproject.org. Um, there's also drscottstoll.com has some resources and some information on our immersions. Um, and those are two really easy places to connect. Uh, and to connect with me. So I just want to share this one thing with you, Chris, because I think it's so important. And, um, you know, I really believe in, in collaboration over competition. And so I just read this last week, this wonderful African proverb that says that if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, you go together. And so, um, you know, it's been really wonderful to spend this time with you. And I want to just offer that if I can support you in any way, you know, we want to come alongside of you and help you um, go forward because we're going to go much further uh, together and bringing change to a lot of people than we will individually. Teammates. That's right. <laughs> we are. That's right. <laughs> wonderful. That's wonderful. I've heard that proverb too. I love it. Okay. Well, great. I'll, folks, thanks for watching. I will put links to d uh, all things Dr. Stoll, Plantrician, his books, everything uh, that, that I can find. Uh, below this interview if you're watching on crispycancer.com. If you're watching on YouTube or listening to the podcast, there will be a link to the show notes. Uh, so just click that and then you can find and connect with Dr. Stoll and uh, look up the Plantrition Project, look, look up his one-week immersive program that he does every year and, um, and find his book on Amazon and stuff like that. So again, thank you, Dr. Stoll. It's awesome. I'm just so thrilled to connect with you. I love what you're doing. I love your message. It's just wonderful. And, and it, you know, I didn't even take enough time to say like how amazing it is. And I'll just say it now that you have put forth this monumental effort to co-found the Plantrician Project, to host this giant conference, to shift the medical community away from, you know, this sort of victimization of patients to empowering patients. Like, wow. I mean, it's so huge, man. Like you're you're changing the medical industry, like what you're doing. I'm trying to change people and maybe I'm getting through to some, I know I am getting through to some doctors because they, they reach out sometimes, but but you really are, uh, in, you really have infiltrated the medical industry with such one like such a wonderful message and solution to chronic disease. So like, anyway, just wanna, just wanna like really just hammer you with some uh, love there. <laughs> Thanks, Before we Chris, jump off. Thank you so much. It's been such an honor to be with you today. And uh, I, I really am so grateful. I really am. And I applaud all of your work. And again, if I can support you in any way, I, I'd be happy to do so. Thank you so much. Okay, everybody. Thanks for watching. Please like and share this video. People in your life need to know that uh, disease can be healed. It can be reversed. That your choices matter. You have the power to change your life and your health. And a lot of that power is really just what you poke on the end of the fork. So anyway, that's it for this episode. I'll see you guys on the next one. Bye, Dr. Stoll. Bye-bye.